You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We have an exciting, fun plan for this summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, You won't be bored. You won't be bored. That's right. (laughs) Um, So much to enjoy, so much to learn. And we are excited to uh, to share a really great summer reading plan for you. Mm -hmm. So lots of summer reading going on um, this week. So we'll we'll share more about that in a little bit. Sorry, just a little sneak peek. Uh, (laughs) Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Boyle. He's pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and Grace Lutheran Church in Wichita, Kansas. Pastor Boyle, thanks so much for being our guest today. Oh, it's a joy to be with you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Sarah. It's always fun to have a guest who says, uh, if you have a good topic, throw it my way and I'll run with it. And uh, (laughs) Dr. Boyle is always one of those guests who will do that. And so we pitched the idea of how about a summer reading list for uh, of the the church fathers. Mm -hmm. And then I challenged you to to like narrow it down to a number like three or five (laughs) or ten. And what did you come up with? You came up with what 15. Is that right, Pastor Boyle? I think 15 would be a good start. And, and our, family, our family doesn't know what it means to be bored, so you'll, you'll have Very to. Good. With us. <laughs> <laughs> well, why? Let's start with why read the Church Fathers. Well, um, a number of reasons. First of all, because they have something to say to us, and and I think there's always uh, worth and value in listening to someone that's got something to say. There's something about being open to listening and, uh, of course, being critical at the same time, but but first having a charitable here. And these are uh, men typically, although there are early church uh, mothers, we might say, but but typically men that have spent either time literally with the apostles or with those that were with the apostles or have at least been received in their writings, handed down for centuries for, for many of these that we'll go through, far more than a millennium. And so there's a reason why what they've said has stuck with us. And perhaps we've got something to learn from that. The other side of this would be that if we are only listening to our own conversation, we all know the problems of an echo chamber and that sort of thing. When we're stuck in our own culture, when we're stuck in our own time, when we're stuck in our own language and vocabulary, we're bound to miss something and have our own blind spots. These Reading the Fathers, they kind of open you up to your blind spots. They invite repentance. They invite you to learn something new. And they invite you into the strengthening of what has been consistently handed down. Mm -hmm. How then do we regard the writings of the Church Fathers? Uh, Well, it's interesting. One of the texts on my list is uh, what's called the Epistle of Barnabas. And it is from possibly the end of the first century, if not the very early second century. And I bring that one up in particular because we discovered it as it was attached to the New Testament in one of our very early codices. We've got these, I don't want to get too much into the details here, but at Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Seminary there, or monastery there, we found a text, the earliest text that we could find of a full Greek copy of the New Testament. And immediately following the New Testament is this epistle of Barnabas. And there are some of the fathers that would refer to it as scripture. And so when we're dealing with some of these especially early texts, the line between scripture and maybe pious writings is a bit harder to discern than it is obviously centuries later and and, uh, later writings and so forth. But but some of these, I mean, we should consider, and, and as we read them, they will sound very much like Scripture. For our purposes, they, they've not been included in the canon for various reasons. And so we ought to read them with, I think, a great deal of charity, but also with a, a way of seeing them through the lens of Scripture. So it's it's the Scripture that gives us kind of the backbone of how we determine and how we read all other writings. And these fathers then would be no other exception. All right. So who made the top 15 list of the not bored uh, Boyle family uh, (laughs) reading the church father's summer reading list? 
Perfect. Well, we're gonna we're gonna try to run through this in as close to a chronological fashion as we can. So we'll start at the beginning, and that's uh, with one of my favorites, Polycarp. And uh, you know, I don't think you get any extra credit for naming your child Polycarp today, but it, it was a thing back then. And and this this man sat at the feet of Saint John the Apostle and the Evangelist. And so, uh, talking about proximity to the scriptures themselves. He is one of those that was hearing from St. John. In fact, uh, John writes his revelation in one of the seven churches to whom he addresses that is Smyrna, where Polycarp is bishop. And so here we have an engagement within scripture itself of this person outside of scripture. So we're going to start with Polycarp. He has... um, not not a whole lot of writings, but he does have an. He's got a couple of epistles, uh, letters that he writes. Uh, one of which is to the Philippians, and so you're you're addressing this community that Saint Paul has also addressed. Uh, but for our purposes, we're going to look at the martyrdom of Saint Polycarp. And I will say, martyrdom is maybe not the most cheery thing to read over a summer vacation, but. At the same time, uh, I read this aloud to our family, our kids, and we've got five kids, ages 8 to 13, and they loved it. They thought it was the coolest thing. So I would say this is good family reading. Uh, If I could, Polycarp, by the way, died uh, somewhere mid-2nd century, maybe 150, 155. And this accounting of his martyrdom, obviously he didn't write it, but it was written about him, and it has some of the things he said at the martyrdom. But this is also a way of realizing the state of Christianity in these early early decades of the church. And so uh, just a, a couple things, I'll uh, preface this with, uh, this is chapter three, where uh, it says, but upon the whole multitude, marveling at the nobility of mind displayed by the devout and godly race of Christians, they cried out, away with the atheists, let Polycarp be sought out. And so here's this striving after Polycarp. And um, a little bit later, this is one of my favorite sections. It's chapter nine. Now as Polycarp was entering into the stadium, There came to him a voice from heaven, saying, Be strong, and show thyself a man, O Polycarp. No one saw who it was that spoke to him, but those of our brethren who were present heard the voice. And as he was brought forward, the tumult became great when they heard that Polycarp was taken. And when he came near, the proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On his confessing that he was, the proconsul sought to persuade him to deny Christ, saying, Have respect to thy old age and other similar things according to their custom, such as swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say away with the atheists, who of course they mean Christians there. But Polycarp, gazing with a stern countenance on all the multitude of the wicked heathen then in the stadium and waving his hand toward them while with groans he looked up to heaven and said away with the atheists you see his little turn of phrase there then the proconsul urging him and saying swear and i will set thee at liberty reproach christ polycarp declared eighty and six years have i served him and he never did me any injury how then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? So just a, a short taste of Polycarp's martyrdom and uh, the stoutness of this man of Christ, I think, is well worth emulating. That sounds fantastic. So we've got one down. We've got one. Poly- All right. <laughs> What's number two? Uh, number two is going to be Ignatius of Antioch. Yes. Uh, Ignatius is a friend of Polycarp, and they write letters back and forth to each other. Ignatius also writes numerous letters to the churches, and it seems like some of these happen while he is on his way to his martyrdom. And so uh, you've got these these great figures of the church, the so-called leaders and so forth, but the bishops, those that are the, the heads and, and part of the idea of the Romans, if, if we take out the heads, then the body dies. What they found is, in fact, quite the opposite. 
taking out these heads, it only strengthened the body to raise up even stronger heads. And so the church lived and grew by the blood of the martyrs. So you've got Ignatius, who's similar time frame. He dies, you know, some say he dies early, like 108. Some would put it a little later, closer to Polycarp 140, 145, something like that. But he is engaging with Trajan, the Roman emperor. And I'm going to, again, from his martyrdom, uh, I, I will say his epistles, if you read those, and, and I would encourage them with this, um, they sound a lot like the epistles in the New Testament. You'll be reading these and you'll, uh, you'll even hear phrases that are coming from Paul and so forth. And um, it just sounds, especially he's writing to the Ephesians, he's writing to the Philippians, the Magnesians, the Tralians, the Romans. He's addressing all of these communities that St. Paul has set up or that have spread from those churches. So it sounds like the New Testament. In his martyrdom, he ends up saying, uh, well, I'll pick it up here with Trajan. Trajan said, do we not then seem to you to have the gods in our mind whose assistance we enjoy in fighting against our enemies? Ignatius answered, thou art in error when thou callest the demons of the nations gods. For there is but one God who made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that are in them. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, whose kingdom may I enjoy. And Trajan said, Do you mean him who was crucified under Pontius Pilate? Ignatius replied, I mean him who crucified my sin with him, who was the inventor of it, and who has condemned and cast down all the deceit and malice of the devil under the feet of those who carry him in their heart. Trajan said, Dost thou then carry within thee him that was crucified? Ignatius replied, Truly so, for it is written, I will dwell in them and walk in them. Trajan then pronounced sentence as follows, we command that Ignatius, who affirms that he carries within him, him who was crucified, be bound by soldiers and carried to the great city Rome, there to be devoured by the beasts for the gratification of the people. And when the holy martyr heard this sentence, he cried out with joy. I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast vouchsafed to honor me with a perfect love towards thee and hast made me to be bound with iron chains like thy apostle Paul. And having spoken thus, he then with delight clasped the chains about him. And when he had first prayed for the church and commended it with tears to the Lord, he was hurried away by the savage cruelty of the soldiers like a distinguished ram, the leader of a goodly flock, that he might be carried to Rome, there to furnish food to the bloodthirsty beasts. Okay. So good. <laughs> and we have more to uh, more of the church fathers to discuss uh, and to propose that you read this summer uh, in your summer adventures. We're going to continue this conversation with Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Boyle, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and Grace Lutheran Church in Wichita, Kansas, in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking with uh, Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Boyle, taking a look at a a proposed summer reading program, summer reading mm -hmm. plan. Uh, Dr. Boyle's top fifteen church fathers to read this summer, and uh, so let's see. We've covered two: Polycarp <laughs> and Ignatius. Uh, so who who comes in at number three, Pastor? 
Well, that would be this epistle to Barnabas that I mentioned earlier. So we won't spend time on that, but I would simply say read it. It is a beautiful epistle. Uh, It is full of strange stuff, too. So part of reading the fathers is being open to some of their strangeness, some of their illusions, the way they use texts. It is incredible. And the epistle of Barnabas has some of that going on where he'll talk about the circumcision of Abraham and how he gets to the number 318 and what the numbers and the letters symbolize. And it's it's just fun. It doesn't mean you have to hold on to it as gospel truth. And yet we're seeing how the early church read these texts and how they believed them and ran with them. So I'll skip reading a portion of that for right now. Uh, and I'll jump to Justin Martyr. Who also, these are all roughly first, second century. So Justin Martyr lived to 100 to 165. He is a great de- defender or apologist for the faith. And he's got two apologies and a dialogue with Trifo. These are all both fairly lengthy. I, I will say the earlier texts that I read from, they're all short. You could read all of the letters and all of the martyrdoms in an afternoon. So uh, these are simple. The, the apologies are a bit longer. And so what I'll do is simply read a portion of that. This is his first apology, and this is chapter uh, 67, where he says, Afterwards, continually, we remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep them together. And for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, All who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray, and as we said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought And the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. And the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each and a participation of that over which thanks have been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. Okay, so that's just a small section of his really speaking about what the weekly worship of Christians is. And it's incredible how that simple form, what we might sometimes call the ordo of the Christian liturgy, is there already in the early second century. And we still continue in that, uh, especially uh, among us today on Sundays. So I would commend you this first apology of Justin as a way of uh, at least getting into some of the early form of what our Christian liturgy is. Fascinating. All right, what's next? (laughs) Next. Next is St. Irenaeus, and I, uh, I'm i not going to read from that, but Irenaeus, uh, I will say, has an incredible five books against the heresies. These are incredible, um, very difficult as far as trying to get through some of the Gnostic, because he really goes into what the Gnostic heresies are, and he outlines them in a very helpful way, but it's, it's kind of dizzying of the mind to try to follow it. Uh, Where he is most helpful and is against the heresies, though, is his simple way of speaking about how to understand the scriptures and the way that we're to, the Gnostics are taking these scriptures and kind of breaking them up and trying to rearrange them in a way that is not fitting with how we are to rightly understand them. So um, a short little snippet from against the heresies, uh, we might say, The church, this is from his chapter 10 of book one, the church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. She believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God, and the advents and the birth from a virgin, and the passion and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven and the flesh, 
of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his future manifestation from heaven and the glory of the Father to gather all things in one and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race in order that to Christ Jesus, our Lord and God and Savior and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess to him and that he should execute just judgment towards all, that he may send spiritual wickedness and the angels who transgressed and became apostates together with all ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men into everlasting fire. But may in the exercise of his grace confer immortality on the righteous and holy and those who have kept his commandments and have persevered in his love, some from the beginning of the Christian course and others from the date of their repentance, and may surround them with everlasting glory. So here we, we get an early, just as we heard briefly in Justin, but an early form of the creed, an early confession of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all that he's done for us. So I encourage you to read Irenaeus, uh, especially his Against the Heresies, but, but also he's got a shorter book that's much more manageable called Apostolic Preaching. And that's a, a great text as well. All oh, right. Well, let's see. Polycarp, Ignatius, Epistle to Barnabas, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus. Who's next? Six is Melito Sardis, which I've already written on the blog for the Lutheran Witness. So you could read about his on Pascha there. And uh, Melito of Sardis, uh, someone that is just incredible writer. The, the sermon is incredible. So I would read on Pascha. Seven. On the Apostolic Tradition by St. Hippolytus. This is a great text also from the late 2nd, early 3rd century. So now we're moving into the 3rd century on what it is uh, that, or how it is that the liturgical ordering of the service is set. And so what we have is a firmer, we had already Justin giving us a snippet. Here we have Hippolytus giving us a fuller unraveling of what the service is, how it's set in place. And it's really uh, an early, what we might call a hymnal or a gender or how the church orders itself. So that's uh, Hippolytus, apostolic tradition. He also, by the way, may have been a disciple of Irenaeus, which is kind of cool to keep that tradition going. Very good. Eight. What is next? Yes. Eight, eight, Cyprian of Carthage on the unity of the Catholic church. This, uh, this text you can get fairly accessibly. He's got a number of treatises in it. It's part of the po popular patristic series. But a great text is for us thinking through what the church is. And sometimes, uh, sometimes when we're considering the unity of the church, we, we get quite parochial. And, and he's constantly bringing us back to what it means to be those that are tied to Christ. So... Um, what it means to be bound to a head, to submit to the receiving of the gifts from the altar. This is a great text to find our unity in Christ. He's got a famous line. He cannot have God as his father who does not have the church as his mother. So to find ourselves being born from the waters of baptism, fed by the Holy Communion, and, and taught to speak by the words of the scriptures. This is a, a great text to orient ourselves within the church. So that brings us to number nine, but I have a proposal here, Dr. Boyle, because I don't think we're going to make it through all 15. <laughs> uh, can we can we do one more segment to share with our listeners tomorrow as well? Because I want to get through all 15. So if we can wrap up with number nine, maybe, I don't know if we'll get in number 10, and then we'll we'll do the the rest for a, a segment for the next day. Is that okay? That, hey, that sounds great. And I'll, I'll do nine and 10 in, real quickly, because nine is going to be St. Athanasius on the Incarnation, which I've also written about for the Lutheran Witness. So you can read that there. 10 is St. Cyril of Jerusalem, and he's got these lectures on the Christian sacraments. It's a great text, especially to go to right after Easter, because these are texts on the sacraments for those having been baptized at Easter and now are being raised and taught in the faith and what the sacraments mean. So it's good for us as well as we go through what is the Christian life for us. Such good stuff here. And we're not going to, we're not, we're going to have to pause for today to end the program for today. Um, but we're going to come back. We're going to record one more segment with Dr. Boyle so we can finish up his list yes. of summer reading for the summer. Um, I, I don't know. 
Can, do you think you can pack all this in, Sarah? Can you read all these this summer? I'm going to try to. <laughs> I'm looking up if there any of these are audiobooks. That's right what now I was because... just going for, too. <laughs> How many oh, audiobooks can I pack in? I love around? audiobooks, but no, read these texts. Uh, I don't think it'll come as easily to listen to. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> We're talking with Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Boyle, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and Grace Lutheran Church in Wichita, Kansas, with his uh, summer reading list with the Church Fathers. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Gulsa. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Hi, I'm Pastor Sean Smith, host of Concord Matters, where we seek to be of one mind that is the mind of Christ. Join us as we read through the book of Concord and look at confessional topics as learned guests and lively discussion will lead us to appreciate how the treasures of the Lutheran confessions apply in the 21st century as much as they did in the 16th. So join us every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central on KFUO Radio or on demand through the Concord Matters podcast. Until we convene for Concord again, keep confessing, church. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. We are continuing our conversation with the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Boyle, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and Grace Lutheran Church in Wichita, Kansas, with his great summer reading list with the Church Fathers. Pastor Boyle, welcome back to the Coffee Hour, and thanks so much for, uh, for making some time for us and this great list of reading for the summer. Well, thank you, and thanks for putting up with me, because this is going to take a lot longer than I had ever thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good list for reading the summer. So much you can yes. learn. Uh, okay, before we get to 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 on your list, what is, what's just one thing, I'm sorry to narrow it down, what's just one thing that you've learned from reading the Church Fathers that's been so helpful to you, whether in, in your vocation as a pastor or as a, as a husband, father, whatever it may be, uh, as a child of God. Um, what's one thing that you've learned from the Church Fathers that's been so helpful to you? Good. That is a good, tough question. But I would say probably first to come to mind is that I'm not alone. I'm not creating this. I'm not having to come up with my own way but I am standing in a tradition of those that have gone before me, that have laid out the path, that have heard the words, that have formed their life according to it. And I am simply given to follow in that, to glean from them what, what they would give to me. And so that's, that's part of the joy is the strengthening of faith in the Christian life. All right. So we've covered one through uh, 10 yesterday in our program. So we're on to number 11. What is, who is number 11 in your list? Well, let me first say that through the first 10 that we covered yesterday, we have worked our way. Uh, we ended very quickly with Cyril of Jerusalem, and that brought us into the fourth century. So Athanasius as well is early fourth century. And so we've got Cyril of Jerusalem, fourth century. Now, number 11 is St. John Chrysostom. And he's known as Chrysostom, the golden mouth, and he has written incredible amounts. Uh, read his commentaries on the scriptures. Those are wonderful. What I want to draw our attention to is a little booklet called On Marriage and Family Life, where he has, uh, I think it's great for us to be reading and being strengthened in our families, but he's got a, a homily on Ephesians 5 that I thought has so much good to glean from it. So let me just read a short portion of that. He says, You have seen the amount of obedience necessary. Now hear about the amount of love necessary. Do you want your wife to be obedient to you as the church is to Christ? Then be responsible for the same providential care of her as Christ is for the church. And a bit later on, he says, He accomplished this not with threats or violence or terror or anything else like that, but through his untiring love, so also you should behave toward your wife. Even if you see her belittling you or despising and mocking you, still you will be able to subject her to yourself 
through affection, kindness, and your great regard for her. So uh, let's not think that the early church just hates women and wants them to be submissive. This is an incredible call to the man to be the one that is showing the affection and care to her and for her. That's Chrysostom. Uh, lived 347 to 407. So now we're into the early 5th century. Very good. Who's at number 12? St. Augustine. Read his confessions. I, that's the first thing I would go to. It's it's beautiful. It's, it's all a prayer. It's a prayer. So read his confessions. Uh, if you've got time after that, read his on Christian teaching, which is a great text, especially on uh, Christian education. And so that's a formative one, especially if you're plotting through how to start the next school year. Read his on Christian teaching. Lastly, he's got a text on the Enchiridion, or called the Enchiridion, where he works through what is faith, hope, and love. So all three Augustine texts, pick one, go with it this summer. Sounds fantastic. Uh, we are up to number 13. What is number 13 in your list? St. Cyril of Alexandria, who is a hero of mine, his text on the unity of Christ. He lived 376 to 444, so we're in uh, now mid-5th century, great defender of the two natures of Christ in one person. Read his on the unity of Christ as he's writing against the sort of Nestorian tendency to pull apart the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Anything else about the, was it St. Cyril of Alexandria? Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, you'll find him all over, by the way, the confessions. So we, we loved his Christology and that's what led us through. Interesting. You've got us like scribbling. I'm sure all the <laughs> listeners too were like scribbling down notes, every little detail as you speak. Okay. <laughs> number 14. You know, the nice thing about radio and especially internet, you could just pause and <laughs> it's uh, it works wonderful. Uh, okay. The last two are, both uh, Leo the Great and then Gregory the Great, popes from Rome, Leo the Great from the 5th century, 400 to 461, Gregory the Great, uh, sometimes called the last of the of the early church fathers, who 540 to 604, and that's going to be our cutoff point. But both of them read their homilies, Leo especially. Uh, right now this week, this Thursday, is the Ascension of Christ, and he has some of the most beautiful homilies on the Ascension. His uh, homily 73 and 74 are where I would really direct your attention, where you see, in fact, our humanity ascending with Christ at the right hand of the Father. It's beautiful stuff. Lastly, Gregory's pastoral rule. This is a text uh, for especially what it means to be a pastor. So for me, it was very beneficial uh, to, to hear. I immediately after reading this found how unfit I am for the ministry because it is an incredibly weighty uh, task that he lays out. Uh, one brief little snippet, he says, for it is indeed difficult for a preacher who is not loved, however well he may preach, to be willingly listened to. He then who is over others ought to study to be loved to the end that he may be listened to and still not seek love for its own sake, lest he be found in the hidden usurpation of his thought to rebel against him whom in his office he appears to serve, which thing Paul insinuates well when manifesting the secret of his affection among us says, even as I please all men in all things, and yet he says again, if I yet pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Thus Paul pleases and pleases not, because in that he desires to please, he seeks that not he himself should please men, but that the truth should please men through him. So uh, just a way of calling pastors out of themselves into the office for the sake of the love of their, their people. I think you mentioned that uh, Gregory the Great was kind of marked as the, the last of the great church fathers. Yes. What was significant about this era or what marked them as Leo the Great and Gregory the Great as the last of the, the, the great church fathers? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Not Leo as much. He's he's earlier, but but Gregory. It seems to be that there comes shifts in the Roman Empire. I mean, we've already seen Augustine ha is sitting right on the fault line of the sack of Rome, and so we've got we've got things changing in the empire. We've got cha things changing in the church. We still will have an ecumenical council after this. So we we may in fact take the early church up at least through six eighty one and end of this year with the 
ecumenical council there in Constantinople. But Gregory is often marked as that end, uh, perhaps for his own brilliance in the sense that he is, he is a sort of capstone figure to that. Uh, we will find later someone like Maximus that, that would be a good fit following, but at the same time, that's about 80 years afterwards. So um, Gregory is kind of a dividing line between early and then what starts to be medieval and a uh, shift in mind towards a scholastic ordering of these things. So talking about this timeline has me thinking now <laughs> about the history of the, the church and all of these people that have come before us. And obviously Lutheranism wasn't even remotely a, an idea or a thing um, as we know it today. How do we uh, find all of our all of our rich Lutheran doctrine and all of these church fathers in, in this legacy of writings? Well, that's a great point. I would say, especially to emphasize, as we have it today, the Lutheran faith is nothing new, and it's certainly not 16th century. That's where we have to clarify it in the face of abuse. But this is what I love about the fathers. It's so Lutheran. There's so much in this that is, in fact, our faith, which is why our own confessions have a catalog of testimonies to say we're not saying anything new. This is what the church has always believed, taught, and confessed. And these fathers are great points of grasping onto that. And as far as that goes for us as Lutherans, if we can't find our faith in these fathers, there's something wrong with our faith. So how do you get your hands on all these writings that you've shared with us today? Do you have a great resource to point us to, or do you just spend countless hours like uh, scouring the internet to buy up books and, and put them on your shelves so you can read them? How do you go about uh, gathering all these writings? You can come to my library. Uh, okay. That's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, much of these. Okay, so I read from a number of the, especially the early apostolic fathers, Justin Martyr, and yes, Leo, Gregory, a lot, Augustine, you can find Chrysostom all in this free online, you could find it all online. The Antonicene fathers, the Nicene, post Nicene fathers. If I knew the website offhand, I would give it to you. I just, I deal with books, but. Uh, but it's all free online. There's a, there's like Christian classical ethereal library or something like that, that you can find these texts in an older translated form. So you're going to have a bunch of these, thou's, dosts, and so forth. The other major resource is uh, I love the series that St. Vladimir Press has put out um, where they take short works, give a good introduction to them, and the books are all... Yeah, you could picture yourself sitting on the beach with a nice Christian beverage in hand, reading like St. John of Chrysostom on marriage and family life. And it's not overwhelming. It's 100 pages, something like that. And you're, you're, you're good to go. So go to St. Vladimir's Press and, and find those. Outstanding. Well, this is a, a great resource. And now I have a noble task ahead of me for yes. today to plan out my summer reading. <laughs> thanks for this great list. Dr. Boyle, thank you so much for putting together, putting all the time into to, uh, writing this list for us to share with our listeners and, and spending time with us, uh, uh, giving us just a little glimpse of each one of these great church fathers to, uh, to spend some time reading this summer. Thanks so much. You are most welcome. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth.